1826, French author Anthelme Ria Savarin wrote this famous phrase that really kind of shaped people forever. He said, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you who you are. You are what you eat. That's essentially what it came down to. And so that saying, that statement, we've, we've heard it before. We've heard it probably many times. People have told us whether we're eating good things like carrots or maybe not so good things like Big Macs, that you are what you eat. And so what you ingest, what you put into you will either make you healthy or not so healthy, right? We understand that. But many, many centuries before Anthelm wrote those famous words, someone else wrote something incredibly similar, but much, much deeper. Augustine of Hippo, who was one of the early church leaders, wrote something along the lines of who you are is what you love. Even more so than what you eat, who you love or what you love defines you. And the challenge with that is sometimes the things we love or even the people we love aren't the right choices. In fact, that is a reality that people have dealt with since they were made. Sometimes we love things that aren't worth loving. They aren't necessarily bad things, but aren't the right things. As we've been in this series called The Big Picture, we've been looking at the story God has for us as it unfolds through Scripture and that we actually find ourselves in. And we start off with the creation, that the creation is good and God uh, loves all of creation and, and wants the creation to work together in harmony. And then we saw how we as people made decisions that were contrary to what God had invited us into, and there were consequences to it. And as a result, creation and everything kind of just fell apart, and we're living in that consequence even now. But in the midst of those consequences, last week as we explored, God had a promise for us that even though we weren't always faithful to him, he would be faithful to us. And because he is faithful to us, even when we're not faithful to him, he invites us into something so much better. That big word, covenant. A relationship that is deep and meaningful and purposeful and is meant for so much more than we could experience outside of that relationship. And last week, David helped us to understand the significance of God inviting us into that covenant. And so you would think, or at least I would think, that if God came to me and said, hey, Rob, I got something great for you. You are going to, you know, be the father of many nations. You are going to be great. You're going to be blessing all people. And through you, people will be blessed and you'll be blessed. I would think that if God came to me and said something like that, I would do everything I could to maintain that relationship because I had heard directly from God. God had spoken to me and I'd say, wow, this is amazing. And even if God hadn't spoken to me directly, if he had spoken to someone else directly and I knew that were, God was talking to that someone, and then they came to me and said, hey, Rob, this is what God says. I would listen. At least I think I would. Actually, probably I would. Probably because the way human history has gone, especially from the understanding of this big picture of the Bible, is we didn't listen. And that comes to us in the form of what we love. Many people throughout history, including now, have chosen not to love God, but love something or someone else. And as a result, that covenant that promise, that agreement God had with us that he invited us into gets broken, not by God, but by us. And that thing that takes our attention away from God, that focuses our love somewhere it didn't belong is called an idol. Idolatry, the worship of an idol, is one of the biggest challenges we as human beings face all the time. And really we've faced it since the beginning. John Calvin, who is a church reformer, some of you might be familiar with him, he wrote this thing called the Institutes, he said that the human heart is an idol factory, that we create 
idols all the time because we're always looking for something to love, to worship, and to take a place that it's not meant to take. And we might not do it intentionally, but it just happens. So what is an idol, and why is it such a big deal? Well, as we look at the story of the big picture, and we start with God creating creation good, that includes us and everything, and we see how his creation made some decisions that weren't so good and moved away from that goodness and caused pain and suffering and sorrow, and we live in that right now, and we saw how God tried to bring them back and say, hey, I've got a promise for you. I want to get you back to that garden, to that place of perfection, if you follow this direction. We see that sometimes people grow impatient in waiting to get back there, so they try to do it on their own. And for a lot of us, when we think about the idea of idols or idolatry, if we have a little bit of exposure to Christianity or Judaism, or even to movies around the time of Easter, we think of the idea of a golden calf, a story that comes to us in Exodus, a story that unfolds where Moses, who's invited the people to come out of Egypt, be rescued by God. They travel through the wilderness, and God invites Moses up to the mountain to speak with him and to hear his instruction for this new covenant he has with his people, these instructions on how to be with him. And as they, he goes up, the people are staying below, and they get a little impatient. I don't know how long it took for them to get impatient, but in Exodus chapter 32, it starts off like this. It says, when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming from down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, who was his brother, and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So these people who've had this amazing experience with God have been rescued out of slavery. And if you followed the story before, you know that they kind of complain the whole way there. They get to this place where Moses has done some amazing things by the power of God. You know, he's made sure they're fed. He made sure they were rescued. He made sure they had water. He made sure everything was taken care of. And then he goes to be with God. And they go, ah, this is taking too long. You know, this is taking way, way too long. And, and in fact, God has been leading them this whole way through the desert, and they know it. They know it's pretty obvious, but they go, wow, you know what? I think, I think it's just taking too long. And they say, hey, Moses' brother Aaron, why don't you make us a God who's right here, right now? So the people's hearts go to this place where they're like, hey, I want immediate satisfaction and Moses is taking too long. So let's just make a God. You know, no big deal, just make a God. And the story goes that Aaron gathered all the gold that they had. They had, they had brought some gold with them, and everybody's gold is taken there, and they melt it down, and they build this calf, and then they start worshiping this statue of gold while Moses is up there, and God's not too happy. For a lot of us, when we think about the idea of idols, we think of something like this golden cow, this golden calf. But actually, the idea of an idol is not always necessarily a statue or a something that has a physical presence that we put our attention to. Sometimes idols actually are very different than that. In fact, the first time idolatry, the worship of idols, happens is in Genesis chapter 3. And those of you who are familiar with it, and you know we talked about it a few weeks ago, whether you watched it recently or you watched it live a few weeks ago. And we talked about how Adam and Eve were in this place of perfection. And then Adam and Eve are walking around and there's this tree they're not supposed to eat from. And a serpent tempts Eve while Adam is there and says, hey, if you eat this fruit, it'll be good for you. God didn't say, you know, don't touch it. And, you know, don't eat it. And so then he tempts her and she goes and she gets to this point. In Genesis chapter 3, where she sees the fruit as good to eat and beneficial for gaining wisdom and knowledge. So she eats it. In that moment, it is the first time someone worships an idol. You might be thinking, okay, well, what is the idol there? Is it the snake? Is it the tree? Is it the fruit? What is it? It's actually herself. Eve, in that moment, thinks, I know better than God. 
I can make these decisions. The essence of idolatry is taking something and putting it in the place where God belongs. And the place where God belongs is where he directs and guides us. And so when we choose to say, I know better than God, we, in effect, commit adultery. It doesn't have to be a golden calf. It doesn't have to be anything gold or wood or, or metal or anything. It's just when we take something, and it could be something good, and we move it to a place it doesn't belong, it's not good anymore. Idolatry is taking something good and making it something ultimate, which makes it something bad. Meaning, my in intelligence, my knowledge, my willpower, all those things, if I say, like, that's the priority, I'm going to make that the focus of everything I do, I am putting myself in the place where God should be. And my focus and my ability and my knowledge, those are good things. But when they become the ultimate thing, the thing that says that's all that matters as long as I keep doing this and I get what I want, that's a bad thing. That's idolatry. And it's one of the biggest concerns God has for his people. And if you follow the big picture of the Bible, it comes up over and over again because we keep, like John Calvin said, making idols in our heart. Because as Augustine said, what you love is who you are. And so when we choose to love something that's other than God, we choose to put something in its place that shouldn't be there, we are committing idolatry, and it makes everything worse. In the big story of the Bible, as we've seen that a covenant was made by God with his people, we would think and maybe even expect that people would go, you know what, this is important. We need to keep this. We need to worship God. We need to love God. We need to make that a priority. But in fact, they didn't. They went against what they should have done and started worshiping things even when the evidence was in front of them that God was acting and doing and present with them, they chose to worship things instead of God. And you might be thinking, well, you know, that happened in the Old Testament. That's not a big deal. Like, people weren't as intelligent as we are. People, you know, didn't know what we know or even know what they knew in the New Testament. So, you know, ah, that's just weird. Nobody does that nowadays. Well, if you jump ahead in the story of the Bible, the big story is that actually it does continue. All throughout the Old Testament, idols keep popping up. And so we have the presence of an idol in Genesis where, you know, Eve thinks that she knows better. So it's herself. And then we have the presence of a thing, the calf in the wilderness uh, that the people worship instead of worshiping the God who Moses is meeting with. But then a little later on, we have another idol that pops up. And it might be one that we don't expect. And it's Judges. In the book of Judges, we hear the story that the people of Israel, the people of God, are saying, hey, make us like the other countries. You know, give us kings, give us judges, make us like them. We want to be like them. And God's saying, you don't need that. You have me. But they push and they push and they push. And God says, fine, have judges. The people made other people an idol in their lives. And as the story of the Bible, the big picture kind of unfolds more and more and more, we see how people keep putting other people in the place where God belongs or other things. And we get to this place that even in the New Testament, Jesus is encountering people who are worshiping idols. And sometimes it's not so obvious of what they are. One of the consistent interactions that Jesus has with people is religious people. People who, like me, would work in their religious establishment, in their case, synagogues, and they would be people who teach other people about what the Bible says or what God is saying and what God invites them to. But for some of those people, and they get the term Pharisees, what they were teaching became more important than who they were teaching about. What they were teaching was more important than who they were teaching about. So they made it about rules. And they put rules and regulations in the place of God. So as long as you were doing all these things, you were okay. But it really had little to do with God. And so even though they might have been well-intentioned, and the rules, the instructions were a good thing to help keep us aligned with what God is inviting us to, when they made it more of a priority than God, they were worshiping an idol. 
So people tend to worship themselves, as we see in Genesis. People tend to worship things, like we see in Moses' case with the people down on the land at the bottom of the mountain. And then we see that people worship other people when they're trying to be like everybody else. And we see sometimes that they worship establishments, rules, systems, when they misplace where God really belongs. Idol worship was all around in the time of the Bible, but it also is today. And it's one of the challenges that we face in being part of this big picture. We are part of the story of Scripture. No, I wasn't around, you know, 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago or however many thousands of years ago, but I'm still part of the story that's unfolding, just like you are. And even if you're someone who's like, you know what, I don't even know what I believe about God. How could I be in God's story? It doesn't make it any less true. Because if God is, and I believe he is, the creator of everything, he's the creator of you. Now, I might not be sure how that happened, but I know to be true that he is the creator. And because he's the creator, he invites us into, all of us, this relationship, this covenant. And that when we embrace that covenant that we spoke about last week, David spoke about, we start this life of living that's in his way. And as we live in his way, we experience what Jesus calls in John's gospel, John 10, 10, life in all of its fullness. And so even when we do not believe in God, even when we're not sure what we believe in God, even if we, you know, we're watching this stream because somebody invited us and we're not even sure if we want to be watching anymore, well, God still plays a part in our lives, whether we realize it or not. And because God plays a part in our lives, so do idols. So is the reality that sometimes we put things in a place where they don't belong. An idol is a good thing that becomes an ultimate thing in our lives and in effect becomes a bad thing. And so every single one of us is wrestling all the time with an idol. I know I do. I, sometimes I wrestle with the idol of myself, just like Eve did in the garden. And the fact that sometimes I think I know better and I know what to do, so I will act and I will behave and I will do without ever thinking about going to God and saying, hey God, is this the right way to go? Is this lining up with what you teach? Is this what matters? In fact, that wasn't just Eve's challenge of idol worship. Really, it was the people of God throughout the whole, throughout the whole Old Testament. Because over and over again, they were choosing not to follow God's instructions. And we see it especially when it comes to the ideas of justice and mercy in the Old Testament. Over and over again, people are told to live and act justly and to live and act in mercy. But over and over again, they don't follow God's instructions on how to do that. And so over and over again, people are being cheated. People are being hurt. People are being oppressed by the people that God says, you're not supposed to be doing this. People are saying, you're supposed to be better than this. You have a way of living that should be better. But over and over again, they keep going back to it because it benefits them. Maybe it benefits them financially. Maybe it benefits them because it's easy and they're lazy. But it benefits them. So they end up hurting people. Over and over again in the Old Testament, and even today, we think we know better. Sometimes we think we know better, so we think it's no big deal to, you know, exploit the environment for our financial gain. Or we think it's no big deal to exploit people for our financial gain. Things that God actually invited us into doing, like caring for people in the environment, we say that's no big deal because I'm getting something out of it. We make ourselves, our desires, our wants, our prosperity an idol. And for some of us, it's actually a physical thing we worship. We choose to worship a God other than God. And sometimes that is the God of money, or the God of sex, or the God of a different religion. But we put something in the place of God, and we say, this is what I worship. So what my heart loves becomes who I am. It's what I consume. It's what I take part in. It's what I am. I worship these things. And sometimes what we worship is, is other people. 
Sometimes it's celebrity. We, we, we see this a lot. People worship celebrities. People, whether it's in the church or outside of the church, we look at people and go, wow, they're so amazing. I want to be just like them. But really, God's inviting you to be just like you because you are wonderfully made. But if you don't see yourself as wonderfully made and you see other people as wonderfully made, you start worshiping them. And sometimes we do it not even of celebrities. We do it with people we actually know. More often than not, I see parents worshiping their kids. And you're supposed to love your kids. You're supposed to do everything you can to help your kids grow and be who they're meant to be. But more often than not, kids become such a priority for us that we, in effect, put them in a place they don't belong. Where everything we do surrounds, is this good for my child? Is this what gets, you know, are they going to get into an Ivy League school if I do this? Are they going to have the best GPA? Whatever it might be. And we do all these things because we think this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm meant for. And kids aren't bad. They're great. I love my kids. But when they get put in a place they don't belong, and we start to worship them, not realizing it, they become an idol. Sometimes it happens in our romantic relationships or even our friendships where we make everything about someone else. And when that relationship breaks, we are broken too because we put something where it doesn't belong. Over and over again, we fall into the same story that people have throughout history because our hearts are little idol factories. And we always look for something to worship, even when it's not really worth worshiping. So what do we do? How do we move beyond that? In the big story, in the big picture of the Bible, we find ourselves in the place that so many other people have throughout history choosing to put things that don't belong in the place of God, choosing to worship idols. Truthfully, Jesus had a remedy for this. Jesus invited everybody, everybody, and I mean everybody, he met with, he talked to, people who were of one religion or another, people who you know, had idols in their rules and lists and, and Pharisees, those types of people. People who, you know, use sex as an idol. People who were caught into lives that were probably not the lives God wanted for them. Jesus met with all these people. People who made money an idol, like tax collectors. People who made war an idol, like the centurion. Jesus met with all these people, and he invited all of them to love God with everything you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. For Jesus, this was the cure for idol worship. You can't commit adultery if you put God where he belongs. If God goes to the place where he belongs with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, being worshiped, that you love him and you make him a priority, nothing else will take that place. But when all of our heart and all of our mind, all of our strength, all of our, or our soul does not go to that place where we put God, well, maybe it goes to something else, that's when we get into trouble. So Jesus says, if you love God with all that you are, that is the first step in combating idolatry. And then the second part of it is that you love others like you love yourself. Because the truth is that when we love other people, we are demonstrating a love for God. We're invited to love God and to love people out of that love and to demonstrate that love by loving them. That is how we move past idolatry. That is how we step out of the story that everybody has been following since the history of time, of putting things that are good into places that are ultimate and they don't belong and making them into bad things. Instead, we put what is best, God, where it belongs, what is ultimate. And that's a good thing. And when we do that, when we make that a priority, we demonstrate it in how we love others. Because out of the overflow of our heart, our mouth speaks, Jesus would say. And out of our heart comes what we love. If we love God, that flows out of us to other people. But if we love rules and we love following those rules, that will come out to other people. Or if we love ourselves and more than anybody else, that will come out 
or if we love other people more than we love God, that will come out in showing that we aren't really worshiping God. We're making other people's feelings or wants a priority and not God's direction or instruction. So how do we fight idolatry in our lives? We love God and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That is the invitation that we are presented with in Scripture. That as God who created the universe, who made everything good and called it good, and as we in that goodness made choices to step away from it, worshiping ourselves and our own desires and not God, and seeing his creation as something to actually worship in time. As we stepped out of it and everything kind of falls apart and gets messed up, we get into a place where God says, I got a promise for you, and that's you are my people, and I am your God, and if we keep this going, it's a good thing. But even in the midst of that promise, we made choices to say, we know better. Let me do my own thing. Let me get out of it. Let me worship myself. Let me worship other people. Let me worship rules. Let me worship other gods. Because that fulfills my immediate need to be wanted, to be liked, to be prosperous, whatever it might be. But God, all the while, is saying, I want you to have life in all the fullness, like Jesus says. But part of that is to not worship things that don't deserve being worshipped, whether it's money, sex, other people, other gods, or yourself. So when we want to fight idolatry, we want to move beyond those things, we start by loving God with all we are. So that involves praying, worshiping however you worship. And I think the most important way to worship is to serve, is to give yourself to love other people. So you pray, you worship, you read scripture, you know who God is. And then you ask yourselves as you make decisions, you go, okay, does this line up with what God is teaching, what God is inviting me to, or is this just what I want? And then you make decisions to do what God wants as opposed to what you want all the time. So you start with that loving God piece, and then you move into the loving other people, which is a reflection of your love for God. So you treat people with kindness, you're patient with them, you give them opportunities even when they don't deserve it, you're forgiving, you're loving. When we choose to love God and love people and put them in their proper places, we are fighting the worship of idols that exist in our hearts and will take over if we're not careful. I want to pray for you because I want to pray for me that we can make those choices to move beyond worshiping the things that are convenient, the things that are maybe wants in our lives, or maybe we think they're needs, and instead worship the God who invites us into a partnership and into life in all of its fullness. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you that you are a God who has made a promise, but not just made a promise, kept a promise with us that you invite us into life and all of its fullness. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have an open door, an opportunity to know you and experience that goodness of life. But God, I also know that in my heart, sometimes I worship something else. Sometimes it goes to places it shouldn't go. And God, I need your help to stop it. And if anybody else is like me, you know that sometimes we make choices that don't reflect our love for you and in fact, in effect, actually reflect our love for ourselves or our love for things that benefit us but don't show our love for you. Holy Spirit, we need your help. Remind us, open our eyes, make us aware of the idols in our lives. Help us to make decisions that don't reflect what we want or need in a moment like those people in Israel who were rescued by you but felt it was more important to build a calf than to wait to hear from you. Help us not to look to the immediate but to look to the good that is you. And Holy Spirit, help us to let go of our desire to control and make things the way we want for our gain. Jesus, you have given us an opportunity not just to worship God, but to live like we worship God, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and that you invite us into the life of fullness that is embodied with this worship of God, 
this love of God and this love of people. We need to do that more than ever in a world that needs to be loved and to know the love of God. Help us to do that daily and to not put things in the place where you belong, God. Because when we do, people miss out on your love, not just us, but many others. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.